Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan and this is Superhero Rewind. X-Men The Last Stand is not the worst superhero movie ever made. The concept is decent, there's some good acting, the production value is great, there's some really amazing visual effects, and it continues, like the first two films, to ask questions with interesting social implications. It is, however, one of the most disappointing superhero films I've seen, and it's especially disappointing as a sequel. I'd imagine someone seeing this movie without the other two could actually enjoy it more. Heck, it might even make more sense that way. Brian Singer ruined two superhero movies at the same time. He ruined this movie by leaving the project to do Superman Returns, and then he promptly ruined Superman Returns. So this one was directed by Brett Ratner, and though he's a competent director, the tone of this thing is completely different from the first two. One could argue that it feels more like modern X-Men comic books, but I think it's more important to be consistent with the continuity already set up. This is a more realistic X-Men universe, and a generally serious one. Not the place to throw in dozens of mutants from the comics, just to make sure they get on screen somehow, never develop them, and give them irritating one-liners. Now, I realize some of that was going on in the first film, especially with Toad, but X2 got so far away from that, I wanted to see it continue. Now we've got the infamous Juggernaut line, and I'm not going to repeat it because we all know what I'm talking about, and it makes me shake my head every time I see it. I don't care if it's fan service, it doesn't fit in this continuity. Why are there suddenly classes of mutants? Everyone, including Xavier and Magneto, start throwing around this terminology like it's always been there. As I understand it, this idea was borrowed from Whedon's run on Astonishing X-Men. If it had to be there, all we needed was a quick explanation as to why we're now classifying mutants when we hadn't been talking about it like that before. All of a sudden, Xavier is telling Storm he wants her to take over the X-Men. What? Now, I never thought Halle Berry was right for this role. She never had that commanding, no-nonsense presence Storm is supposed to have. She begged and begged for more screen time, and she finally got it, so the script pretends it's got an actress with a commanding presence and gives her a lot of dialogue. But I think she just comes off as a control freak, which I guess makes sense, considering how Halle Berry managed to get Storm in the limelight. And someone has to be in charge, since Cyclops can hardly be in this thing because James Marston is too busy playing a completely superfluous character in Superman Returns. Oh, and by the way, hey, Brian Singer, it's bad enough you had to leave and make a bad movie, but you, you have to steal important cast members for it as well. There's also all of a sudden a danger room. There was supposed to be one in X2, but they didn't have the budget or time to build it, so they left that scene out. Once again, I don't care that it's there, but I want one line about how it was just recently built or something. There's no reason to pretend like stuff has always been in this continuity when it obviously hasn't. And Sentinels, they couldn't come up with a way to put them in the series, so instead they threw one in the danger room just for fan service. Who designed them? Have they fought these things before and just never told us? Because I think it would be really funny if Professor Xavier invented the Sentinels just to give the X-Men something to fight in the danger room. I know I'm already nitpicking, but here's the point. It doesn't feel like the same universe. I hate that all these problems stem from production issues, too. One of the worst being that Cyclops gets killed just because they can't get Marston long enough to give him any screen time. It's sad that that's the best solution they could come up with. A lot of arguments could be made that killing off both Cyclops and Professor X here were good ideas, because it shows how completely defeated Jean Grey is by the Phoenix personality, how deadly she is, and that it creates a real struggle for Magneto, having to continue on with his cause, even while the linchpin in his cause has destroyed his greatest rival, but also his one true friend. Now I'll get to Magneto in a minute, but even if there are good reasons, I really resist killing these characters off so early in the film. When I saw this the first time, I was jarred by Cyclops' death. It came out of nowhere, and that made it really hard to pay attention to what was going on. I just kept thinking, really? He's dead? Surely not. And then when Professor X gets killed, who happens to be my favorite character, and get, always gets shafted in these movies, like Cyclops, I was absolutely numbed. His death was painful to watch, the way he's being ripped apart molecule by molecule and then just disintegrates all at once. It's an amazing effect but it hurt me. I couldn't enjoy the rest of the movie. And by the way, I'm going to talk about this a lot, so if, if Professor X's death didn't bother you, chances are you like this movie a lot better than I do. I think that scene was meant to be powerful, that we're supposed to feel that death, feel like we're losing this great mentor along with the other X-Men, that we're losing our best friend along with Magneto, and that this great force of nature that no one can control is taking it away from us. 
when put like that, I guess it sounds kind of brilliant. But the problem is, not long after, the film does things like give juggernaut one-liners we're expected to laugh at. You do want some humor in a dark movie, but it's not balanced. And this isn't a dark film so much as a film with some dark scenes in it. But perhaps if that had been the climax of the movie, rather than the X-Men fighting a huge battle you know they're going to win, it might have had the emotional resonance it was trying to in the middle of it. I also don't like that Xavier dies before he and Wolverine have a chance to resolve their differences. The story isn't bad in theory. Worthington Labs develops a cure for mutation, and it's made available for any mutant that wants it. Magneto thinks this threatens mutants because he believes there's nothing to cure. He says mutants are the cure, so he starts his brotherhood and plans to take Worthington Labs down and destroy the cure. If there wasn't so much else going on, the story would have worked great. But it has the same problem Spider-Man 3 would later. It tries to do so much fan service that it ultimately disappoints everyone. You can't do a big Magneto story and do Dark Phoenix. So the Phoenix Saga degenerates into a half-hearted attempt at a multiple personality tragedy. According to this movie, the reason Jean Grey was losing control of her powers in X2 is because a dark personality Professor X had helped her to suppress was starting to reassert itself. This puts Professor X in a morally ambiguous place. I'm not saying Xavier should never have to make tough choices. And in fact, it's cool when that happens because it makes he and Magneto not so different from each other. But it's hard for me not to see this as morally reprehensible. Because Jean was too dangerous when she was a kid and saw herself as nearly godlike, he suppressed her real persona and helped her to develop a more docile one. I don't know what he could have done differently, because she never would have gone to his school willingly, of course, but what I take from this is that the Jean Grey in the first two movies is an artificial construction, made by Professor X to keep the world safe, and the real one is essentially an evil force of nature. So Professor X is ultimately responsible for every death the Dark Phoenix causes because she's getting revenge for being buried so long. I don't know if his death is supposed to be tragic or if it's the consequence of making a morally reprehensible choice. And I don't think the filmmakers know either. I think this multiple personality thing is just what they came up with because they didn't want to make the Phoenix an alien and they thought it would be more realistic. They didn't really think through what this does to their already established characters. It ends up just being really depressing. Ian McClellan, as always, turns in a great performance. Unfortunately, I don't entirely buy his motivations in this one. Now, Magneto, discarding Mystique when she's turned human works for me. He wants a world of mutants, and she really isn't one of them anymore. What doesn't work is how he handles Xavier's death. He watches as the Phoenix kills Xavier and still goes on with his plans. I hate this. I think watching the thing he thought would create a mutant-dominating society destroy Xavier would be enough to make him rethink everything, his whole philosophy. It could even be enough to cause a nervous breakdown. I'm glad he doesn't take Xavier's death lightly, but consider toward the end of the big battle when he finally says, What have I done? What makes him say this? Jean Grey starts disintegrating everyone there, humans and mutants. Now, how did he think this was going to turn out? He's got this amazing plan. He's like, okay, I'm going to move a big bridge over this island. We're going to walk across it. Then we're going to start this giant fight. The pawns will go first, and we'll destroy that cure. Don't worry. Even though a lot of mutants are going to die, we've got Jean Grey, and when the time comes, she'll do something. It's going to be awesome. What made him ever think he could control her? He couldn't stop her from killing one man, Xavier, a mutant. And now that she's killing everything in sight, he's surprised. The only thing I can chalk this up to is lazy writing, because I think the death of Xavier would wake him up faster than the death of a bunch of people he barely knows. Those are my major complaints. I think some of the mutants that are introduced are very well done, like Beast and Angel, and of course I just wish they got more screen time. Angel has a nice mini-arc, but we don't spend enough time with him, and I wish he had more interaction with the X-Men themselves. Wolverine's whole arc in this is kind of irritating to me. He's got Storm on his back saying that he has to kill Jean Grey, and I don't understand why either of them thought that would even work. She can disintegrate anything, Jean Grey. How does healing factor counteract that, especially since Rogue nearly killed Wolverine in the first film just by taking his powers so she could heal herself? He's way too powerful in this, and once again, that makes it feel like a different continuity. I hate it when characters don't remember what they've learned from previous character arcs. Rogue shouldn't have taken the cure in this. She should have thought about it, and then she should have been reminded about how she saved Wolverine that one time by taking his power and healing him. 
Her power is sometimes a curse, but it can also be a blessing. Wolverine tells her, I hope you're not doing this for a boy, and from her look, it's obvious that that's exactly what she's doing. Then at the very end, when she doesn't have her powers, Bobby says, this isn't what I wanted, and she says, it's what I wanted, echoing Wolverine's words when he told her not to make this decision for someone else. So she's in denial, and we're supposed to think she's grown as a character. Whatever. You know, X2 didn't have a happy ending, but it left you with some hope. Jean Grey was obviously going to rise from the ashes. A mutant human dialogue was maybe going to open up. There was sacrifice, but there were possibilities. X3 leaves its characters morally ambiguous, or dead, or both, and leaves it open for the entire thing to start all over again. Isn't that uplifting? It left me hollow inside. And no, the stinger after the credits about Xavier in another mutant's body didn't help. X3 gets a 1.5 out of 4 from me. Incredible special effects, fun to see lots of new mutants on screen, and one of the most depressing experiences I've ever had with a superhero film. Next time I'll be doing Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, as requested by Blue Dragon 5, who was the winner of the Batman Trivia Tournament. Thanks, as always, for watching.